can still speak of expression, even if there is a public interest in publishing. Claimants must be able to vindicate their rights in courts where claims are well founded, but the cost of the current system hand the super rich an advantage and can distort outcomes. The scales of justice must balance accuracy with greater tolerance of free speech without a recalibration. The system could enable privatized censorship. Um, uh, 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 powerful stuff um, from a very hard hitting leader column. Now, I know that there are a number of people on this um, call uh, watching um, from their desks um, who have bitter experience of being at the wrong end of defamation proceedings. Um, Gracie and I were chatting before the call. She has been threatened in the past, uh, and I've been threatened uh, on a number of occasions by wealthy political opponents of mine and those whose relationship with government Good Law Project interrogates. Um, we are also at Good Law Project looking to work with those who are being sued for calling out sexual violence, uh, and that's a particularly pernicious um, and long-standing problem. We try to take a principled stance on this stuff, which means being clear and publicly clear where we have got something wrong. But we also want to exercise our legal muscle. Not entirely sure where that muscle is located in one's body, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, we want to exercise our legal muscle to fight where we basically think we've done the right thing and the law should protect us. Anyway, um, enough about uh, Good Law Project's experiences. Um, you didn't uh, attend today to hear from me. Um, I am thrilled to be joined by three uh, leading experts in the field. Um, we will hear from each of them in turn. Uh, they'll speak for between five and ten minutes, uh, and then there will be time to take questions from you. We have some written questions, but please also put your questions into the chat function, and those that are specially selected by our behind-the-scenes team of moderators will be passed through to me on a WhatsApp channel, um, as is all the fashion these days for ministers, um, and, and, and I'll pose those questions and then allocate them to one of Jonathan, Tamsin, or Gracie. Um, so first up, um, the formidable Gracie Bradley, she's the director of our friend, uh, our friends at Liberty, which has a long history of campaigning for free speech um, in the defamation space. Hi, everyone, and thanks very much, Joe and Good Law Project, um, for having me. It's lovely to be here with you today. Um, and yeah, this is a really interesting and thorny topic, and I'm really glad that we can kind of come together and talk about it. Um, and I thought I'd maybe sort of zoom out and talk about the big picture and talk about the context that we're in. Um, and really talk about what's at the heart of, um, of defamation and what's happening with defamation proceedings. I mean, the crux of it is that defamation is about certain kinds of speech. You have a statement which has caused or is likely to cause serious harm to the reputation of an individual or body. That's defamation. And there are a range of defences against uh, defamation claims. And three that I just wanted to highlight briefly were, you know, you have a defence if the statement is substantially true. You have a defence if the statement was an honest opinion. And you have a defence if the statement was on a matter of the public interest. So those are very briefly the contours of, of the discussion and kind of Liberty's area of interest in this matter. Now, obviously, Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is protected in domestic law by the Human Rights Act, sets out that we all have a right to hold our own opinions and to express them. But this isn't an absolute right, and it has to be balanced against, among other things, the rights and reputations of other people. And defamation law is essentially trying to mediate that tension between the right to freedom of expression and the protection of people's reputation. Where does that balance come in? Um, so despite what this government says, and this is where I say I want to talk about the big picture and zoom out a bit, you know, despite what this government often says about the importance of free expression as the bedrock of democracy and so on and so forth, the real context here is that our ability to speak truth to power is very much under attack. Um, 
as supporters of Good Law Project will know, the government has really sidelined Parliament repeatedly through prorogation and throughout the pandemic. It wants to stop people from using judicial review. It's also threatening to water down the Human Rights Act, and it's highly likely that voter ID legislation is going to further disenfranchise people, and especially those of us from marginalised and minoritised groups. So we're in a shrinking space for speaking up, and that's why it's really important that we know our rights when it comes to defamation. And, you know, the threat of legal proceedings can be incredibly intimidating and can deter people from speaking out about all kinds of things. And money and the access to legal advice that money can bring with it can tip that balance disproportionately against people who are trying to speak truth to power. But at the same time, I think it is important to note that, you know, inadequate redress for defamatory statements can also have an impact on people involved in political activism and on people's personal and private lives more generally. So it really is a balance to be struck. Um, I thought what I'd do is maybe just talk a little bit about a case that some of you will have heard of called Stocker, um, because I think this really brings some of these issues to light um, and also speaks to the point around domestic violence um, that, that Joe mentioned earlier. So this was a case called Stocker versus Stocker that ended up being heard by the Supreme Court. Now, the former Mrs. Stocker had said in a Facebook post that during their relationship, Mr. Stocker had tried to strangle her and Mr. Stocker sued her for defamation. And a judge heard evidence about the facts and decided that an incident had taken place in which Mr. Stocker had put his hands under Mrs. Stocker's chin and over her mouth, but with the intention of silencing her rather than killing her. And in the lower courts, the judge decided that the true meaning of the phrase tried to strangle involved an intention to kill, and therefore Mr. Stocker had not tried to strangle, strangle the former Mrs. Stocker. Um, and Mr. Stocker chose not to receive any compensation, but the judge said that he otherwise would have been entitled to £5,000. That's what happened in the lower courts, and the former Mrs. Stocker appealed that, and the main issue before the Supreme Court was the question of how an ordinary person would interpret the phrase tried to strangle. Um, and the, and the Supreme Court essentially found that the way that the High Court judge had attempted to find the meaning of that phrase was wrong. They'd said that was the wrong approach and that in that context of a Facebook post, the words were sufficient to establish that Mr. Stocker was dangerous and that Mrs. Stocker did not have to demonstrate that, the, that her husband had intended to kill her. So she was ultimately vindicated in the Supreme Court, but she had to go through a really lengthy and expensive legal battle uh, that went on for, I believe, five years or so, if not longer. Um, and we can see there that the, the approach of the lower courts would have had a really significant impact. And, you know, those proceedings will have had a really significant impact on Mrs. Stocker, but also on other people, on other victims of domestic abuse who are thinking about speaking out about those experiences. Um, so that's one example. That's one way in which defamation proceedings um, can be used to stifle people. As Joe said, we were chatting before this event started. I personally have been threatened with defamation proceedings for raising concerns about transphobia and other kind of oppressive institutional power dynamics. Um, you know, those that kind of claim of defamation was made at a time in my career when, you know, I'd really come to a point where I, you know, I just wasn't really that bothered. Um, but that was because. I understood, you know, that what I was saying was true. I didn't feel like I was on shaky ground. And I also knew that really it was a tactic to try to silence me. Um, if that had happened to me, you know, much earlier on in my career, I would have been absolutely terrified. That person would absolutely have gotten away with that behavior. Um, so we can see that defamation is also used to try to silence people speaking up within institutions. Um, so essentially, I think I can conclude here, but the point is that defamation can be a tool to silence criticism, you know, within institutions, by journalists, from activists. At the same time, it can also be something that protects people from statements that are untrue and can have a really significant impact on their private lives and on political activism and otherwise. So there's a balance to be struck. And I think, um, you know, the rest of the panel can talk about where that balance lies and some of the more technical questions that no doubt people have. Um, but as I say, thanks very much for having me and I will leave it there. Thank you, Gracie. That's incredibly helpful. 
Um, for those listening who are particularly interested in the domestic violence or sexual violence space, uh, a couple of organizations you might take a look at, uh, the very small um, but mighty Gemini Project uh, and Goodall Project has long been an admirer of the work in this space done by the Centre for Women's Justice. Um, I'm now going to pass over to um, one of two legal experts in the space, uh, Tamsin Allen, who is partner and head of the Media Information Law team at Bymans. I've long been an admirer um, of her work. Thank you, Joe, and thank you very much, Gracie, for setting the stage for um, what I'm going to do, which is to drill down into some top practical tips for activists and campaigners. And you rightly talked about the way governments attacked um, the spaces that we have to speak out and the ways in which uh, highlighted the ways libel laws used to stifle speech and silence criticism. So what I want to do is to talk about what you can do when you're preparing content for publication to protect yourself against the risk of being um, in the frame for in a libel claim. Um, all activists and campaigners are not doing their job unless they tread on toes and you're all publishers. Every time anyone sends an email, posts something on social media, updates a website, speaks on a panel like this, we're all publishers in the eyes of the law. Um, and libel law protect, developed to protect journalists. Now journalists um, uh, uh, previously had the backing of media organizations and money, but as individual campaigners or small NGOs, your publishers without that backup, um, you have the benefit of some of the defenses that were developed for journalists, but also the burden of having to behave like journalists without the resources. You've seen the Good Law Project Guide to Libel, and you know that, um, and as Gracie said, a defamatory allegation is uh, one which identifies somebody and causes or is likely to cause them serious harm to their reputation um, and is published to a third party. That's all a claimant has to prove in a libel claim. The burden then shifts to you, the publisher, the defendant, um, who has to then defend what they've said. It's a difficult place to be. But with, if you take care when you're first preparing your content, you're still able to campaign very effectively and make hard hitting allegations that tread on toes and do speak truth to power. So um, my, there's some common misconceptions just to start with. All defamatory allegations are assumed to be false in law. So it doesn't matter if you know it's true, everybody knows it's true. The starting point is if it's defamatory, it's false and you have to prove it's true. Um, allegedly doesn't work. It's no defense at all to say the Times reported last week that Tamsin Allen was had her fingers in the till. The fact the Times said it doesn't defend you, it might make slight difference to the way the case works, but it does, it's not a defense. If you give information to the media to publish, you could still be sued as well as or instead of the media organization that publishes the information. Um, and another just a misconception just dealing with at the start is that if you tell somebody what you're going to say about them, they can't usually apply for an injunction to stop you. And it's always a better idea to do that for reasons we'll come on to. So the top tips, top tip number one, be very clear about what you're saying. Defamation law is an almost entirely artificial construct and the meaning of what you're saying isn't what you thought it was. It's not what you intended to say. It's not even what you can prove some people think it, you're saying. It's what the judge decides you're saying. And the judge using his, usually his, um, well-known familiarity with ordinary people, he determines um, what an ordinary reasonable reader would think your words meant. If you're ambiguous, you might think you're making things better by being a bit ambiguous, but you're opening yourself up to the um, possibility that a judge will find an unhelpful meaning. So as, as an example, if in a panel, this panel speech, uh, talking about libel broadly, I was to say, as Mr. X will know, accusations of fraud can be difficult to defend. Now, what I meant to say, what I was, what I was meaning 
was that Mr. X made an allegation of fraud and found it difficult to be a defendant when he was sued over that allegation. But a judge might decide that those words meant Mr. X was accused of fraud and found it difficult to defend himself in a criminal trial. And by using ambigu ambiguous words, I might, it might be that a judge could find, reasonably find my words to mean that, even that's not what I meant to say, and it's not what most people understood it to, to mean. I wouldn't have any defense to that. I'd have to apologize and maybe pay damages to Mr. X because um, the judge would have found an unhelpful meaning. Um, the meaning determines everything. Once there's a meaning, then that's how the case proceeds. It proceeds on the basis of that meaning. That's the meaning you have to defend. So the other, as well as being deliberate and clear about what you're saying and not ambiguous, it's also helpful, if you can, to couch things as a question, as grounds to investigate or grounds to suspect rather than making a serious allegation. So, for example, if you can, you can say there are serious questions to be asked about the propriety of the award of a contract to a Tory donor, to use a topical example. Was it good value for money? Was there a risk of conflict of interest? You're asking questions, you're saying there are grounds to investigate. That's much easier to defend than saying the award of a contract to a Tory donor obviously creates a confl conflict of interest and is completely improper. That's an allegation of fact. It's much harder for you to defend it. The, um, you're still putting something into the public domain. Um, you're still raising it as a problem. You're still talking about it, but you're putting it as, as a grounds to investigate, which is helpful to you. Um, so that's the uh, importance of being clear about what you're saying. Don't be ambiguous. Put it as a question if you can. Once meanings established, in your mind, it's a good idea to prepare for uh, uh, what you're saying so that you can defend it more easily. The defences, as Gracie mentioned, opinion, public interest and truth are the main defences that you're going to be relying on. So the second top tip, it's just your view. Honest opinion is a very helpful defence. What you have to do is to make sure that what you're saying is understood as being your view your opinion, your value judgment. Um, it has to be based on something that somebody said or done or something that really happened. Provided it's obvious it's a view and provided it's based on something that really happened, then you can be as rude as you like. You don't have to be reasonable. You can be insulting, unfair, um, provided it's obviously an opinion. Um, so as an example, you could, if you said, Matt Hancock's department awarded valuable contracts to people he has a personal relationship with. It seems to me he's either corrupt, stupid, or both. That is obviously your view. Other people might say, well, no, I don't agree he's corrupt or stupid. He might just have had a very good offer. Um, compare that with Matt Hancock has been involved in a corrupt scheme to award valuable contracts to his friends. That's an allegation of fact. You can't rely on an opinion defense if there's an allegation of fact. You can test the difference by asking yourself, does your expression of opinion leave room for somebody to take a different opinion? Say, well, yeah, you might think that, but I think what they said was reasonable. I think what they did was okay. The great thing from the defendant point of view is, as I said, it can be very unreasonable and unfair, provided it's an opinion and some Examples from real life cases um, in the campaign against anti Semitism um, said that Tony Greenstein was a notorious anti Semite and was dishonest. Um, and the court decided that, though it sounds to me like an allegation of fact, a notorious anti Semite, they decided that was um, an, an opinion um, based on things he'd said. And similarly, um, in another case, a government press release claiming that a man was a, an extremist hate speecher who's legitimized terrorism and from whose speech the students should be protected was an expression of the government's opinion. I mean, it was obviously unfair, unreasonable and, and, um, and a fairly outrageous opinion. Um, but the court decided it was an opinion because readers could go and see what this person had published for themselves 
and they might take a different view. Um, so if you can um, express something as your opinion on what's happened, you have a much broader ambit to be very, very critical of what happened. The other good thing about an opinion um, defense is that meaning hearings happen early on. And if you can establish that the words you used were an opinion um, at an early stage with a court ruling, you can get rid of proceedings quickly, um, which is obviously a much cheaper and better way to deal with them. So that's the second, it's just your view. The second top tip, express it as a view. The third top tip is about public interest defence. Public interest is your friend. Everybody wants to plead truth, and I'll come on to that, and wants, feels that, well, I'm sure that I'm right here, so I ought to be able to say it. Of course, you ought to be able to say it, but you will find yourself in trouble if you um, rely solely on the fact that you're sure it's true. The public interest defence is there to protect you when, for whatever reason, you can't prove it. Maybe your witnesses won't give evidence or you've made a mistake um, or there's something you didn't know at the time you, you published. In those circumstances, you rely on a public interest defence. Public interest isn't what interests the public. It, there's no clear definition of the public interest, but broadly speaking, it's what's healthy in a democracy. And things that you might be doing, exposing misconduct and wrongdoing, are plainly public interest matters. The defence requires you to, first of all, be talking about something that's broadly in the public interest. That's not, um, that's not um, problematic. Um, and also that you reasonably believe that, the public, that you're publishing it is in the public interest. So, do you, firstly, do you believe it's in the public interest to say that? That's not hard to show. Secondly, is your belief reasonable? Now, this gets a bit techie, but broadly, the way that's tested is whether or not you've done a good investigative job. So where the public interest is your friend, you need to be able to demonstrate that you've done a good job, you've been fair and reasonable and responsible in the way you've investigated the story. That usually means that you rely on reliable sources, you express yourself in a kind of sensible way, and often, and where, where it's appropriate, you approach the person for their comments on what you're going to say. Now, uh, you approach people for a right to reply, not to get into an argument with them, um, or to prove them wrong in correspondence. You approach them to either change what you're going to say, because it's obvious you've got something wrong at that stage, or to summarize their response and publish it. So you can say, you know, this policeman is <clears throat> believed to have um, attacked an innocent member of the public at night. Um, they say it wasn't them, it was their brother. Um, we believe it was them, but we, you know, we, here's, here's their denial and here are the reasons. You're being fair to them. You're giving them an opportunity to deny what happened. Um, that is an important but not necessary condition the defence is um, a flexible defence, and um, from the Defratus case, and I believe he's watching today, who was the defendant in that case, David Defratus, the judge, the, the court said, "I would consider a belief to be reasonable for the purposes of section four. That's the public interest defence, only if it is one arrived at after conducting such inquiries and checks as it is reasonable to expect of the particular defendant." in all the circumstances of the case. So top tip number three, the public interest is your friend. Keep a note of the investigations you do. Ask the person if you, if you possibly can, if it's appropriate for their response to the allegations you're going to be making about them. And make sure that you've noted all the steps that you've taken and the checks you've carried out before you publish. If you do that, and you end up having got something wrong and you can't prove what you said to be true, it doesn't matter because you can still defend your position on the basis it was in that you reasonably believed at the time it was in the public interest to make the allegation. Number four, although this session is called Speaking Truth to Power, be careful of the truth. 
Don't rely alone on a truth defence when you're preparing for publication, um, if you can help it. Defamatory allegations are presumed to be false. You have to prove they're true, which means you need the evidence, you have to have the evidence, you have to have witnesses who are prepared to go to court and be cross-examined and uh, go through a very uncomfortable experience and reveal who they are quite often. Although the, balance, the standard of proof is the balance of probabilities, in reality, in a, um, if you make very serious allegations, the court thinks that they're inherently more unlikely and that you need more convincing evidence to prove them to be true. Um, it's expensive. It's not something that can be knocked out at an early stage, usually. Um, so a truth defence is um, not your first option. And always, if you can, think about expressing something as an opinion and um, doing a good job so you can rely on the public interest, that's going to be the better option. Now, obviously, you have to believe what you're saying is true. Obviously, you have to do decent research and be convinced. But in, that, should, that doesn't mean that you should forget about the other defences when you're preparing material for publication. So final tips. Avoid identifying individuals if you can. If it doesn't make any difference to the story, it's not necessary, then avoid it. Be careful they can't be identified anyway. So, for example, if you um, decide to focus on a company, not the individual, be careful that you're not actually accusing the CEO of the company of the wrongdoing. It's much more difficult for a company to sue you. You can be ruder about companies than you can be about individuals because they have to show serious financial harm as a threshold for. Um, being able to sue. So avoid identifying individuals if you can. Do enter into the right to reply process if you can and treat it as an opportunity to protect yourself um, by publishing the um, response of the individual. Be aware of any litigation history, search the people you're accusing and see if they've sued before. If there's somebody who's wealthy and has used litigation before, it just means you have to be extra careful. Don't not say it, but go through carefully what you're going to say. And check your privilege in a libel sense. Certain um, allegations and certain forms of speech are for public policy reasons given additional protection. So there is an absolute privilege, which means you, a libel case won't be able to proceed for anything said in a court, anything said in parliament, um, reports to the police. Um, there are then qualified privileges, for which means that you're protected unless you're um, publishing for some improper motive, um, for publications that are made uh, about reports of press conferences, reports of meetings of public companies. There's a long list of those which you can find online in the schedules to the Defamation Act. Um, so quick recap of the top tips if i was to tell you the things to be particularly careful about they would be one be deliberate about your meaning two set up an opinion or public interest defense if you can and three avoid mentioning individuals where it's not crucial to the message you need to convey and i hope that with those practical tips you can continue to publish hard-hitting, important um, public interest information to the public, despite what's happening uh, with, the, with the government's attempts to shut down other ways that they are being criticised. Thank you. Thank you, Tamsin. That was incredibly helpful. Um, I promised you at the outset that we were going to have um, uh, real expertise on the panel. You'll recall that um, Gracie talked about the Stocker case. Uh, Jonathan Price, uh, our final speaker, acted um, in the Court of Appeal uh, and in the Supreme Court um, in the Stocker case and acted for the winning side in the Supreme Court. Um, so I will now, with some pleasure, um, pass over to Jonathan. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, so I'm uh, going to introduce myself quickly uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, and then I'm going to 
uh, speak briefly um, about what to do if you get a, a threatening letter of claim. Um, so I'm uh, Jonathan Price, I'm a media law barrister at Doughty Street Chambers. Uh, I advise the Council of Europe on uh, matters relating to Article 10 and the protection of journalists and journalism. I also teach a course uh, in transnational law at King's College London where I deal with um, internet publication issues. But as a barrister, I um, spend most of my time advising publishers, journalists, NGOs, activists and individuals, including Nicola Stocker, as Joe's mentioned, um, uh, in particular uh, individuals speaking out against domestic abuse and violence. Um, and I do both pre-publication advice, so I help um, activists and NGOs uh, pre be preemptively defensive in, 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 in how they publish, and then inevitably I pick up um, litigation where, where that hasn't worked. Um, the so that that's um, me. I should say I also um, act for the family of the murdered Maltese journalist Daphne Carana Galizia, and. Um, while hearing Joe and Carrie uh, mention the fact that they are on the receiving end of a number of legal threats, it's um, worth pointing out that in the case of Daphne, she was a defendant um, in over 40 defamation claims at the date of her death and subject of many threats um, over and above that, including uh, on letterheads of London firms, despite the fact that she lived and worked in Malta. Uh, and the um, circumstances that, that pertained at the time that she died, the, 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 the judicial legal harassment that she underwent, the actual harassment of family dog was killed and that uh, was an arson attempt on her house, um, it, it is um, the sort of logical extent of allowing unfettered um, uh, threatening action by uh, rich claimants and uh, something uh, that's been very sobering for me to uh, see at, 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 um, at second hand. So I'm going to talk about those letters of claim and what to do if as an activist, NGO or other publisher you receive one. And um, I don't know how many of you can relate to this but it's a pretty chilling moment you open um, a, a letter or an email and, and you're presented with a, a an expensive looking uh, letterhead and below it some words in capital letters and bold telling you you're in big trouble and uh, they tend to be a number of pages long and use uh, r r frankly almost comically hyperbolic language to describe um, your your publication and the effect it's supposed to have had on this uh, rich and powerful individual who's who, who's said to have been reduced to tears and sleepless nights because of it. Um, so the first thing you should do if you get one of these letters to tear it up, throw it in the bin, have a cry, go to the pub and forget all about it. Well that's what that's what you'd like to do, but but that's that's um, the last thing you should do. The first thing to do is don't panic, just just be calm. I mean, these uh, letters are designed to be intimidatory. It's the intention of those people that write them um, to get the quickest possible result for their client, and um, what they are seeking to do in the letter um, is to get you to agree to the demands at the end without actually focusing too hard on the substance in between. So it's absolutely vital that you treat this as an extension of the publication process that has led to it, because that's what it is. You need to consider it very carefully and you need to try to be as objective and rational as you possibly can about it. And you need to try in doing that to be fair and reasonable to not the lawyers writing the letter, but the, the individual claimant uh, that has instructed them. Now you're bound to have a, a jaded view of that individual before um, you receive the letter. And so it's quite uh, usual to immediately feel oppositional and, and um, under attack. And um, it's very difficult to remain objective, but it's absolutely crucial that you try to do that. So take a deep breath, try to look beyond the hyperbole and bluster um, and take the following steps. So you're going to need uh, to locate and keep all the documents relevant to the threat. So that means documents that uh, you uh, produced and obtained in publishing the material in the first place. And that includes even um, uh, WhatsApp messages 
uh, and and other uh, social media or, or instant messaging service documents um, they will be useful for you on the one hand and necessary if this ever does litigate because you will be required to produce them and even if there are innocent explanations as to why you haven't got them um, the the other side will undoubtedly infer uh, some uh, malicious motive in, in you having no longer um, got hold of them so locate and keep documents that's the first thing you need to be doing look at the letter ask yourself does the letter provide me with information that I didn't previously have? So, um, in other words, am I now being told new information that changes my view as to what I published? And if it does, then you need to be quite clear with yourself that you may have um, reason now to change what you've written. And um, you need to be uh, quite objective about that because you'll be naturally reluctant to uh, change anything you've written because it might be considered to be a win for the other side but doing so uh, at least considering whether or not to do so and recording your consideration will have quite a significant bearing on the availability to you of a public interest defense further down the line so be quite critical about uh, what you've published and try to assess the, any new information um, should you even be taking the story uh, or the article down for the time being? It can be quite, um, again, quite difficult to do that because you feel that there's a sort of win and that free speech is being chilled. But if you can do it on a temporary basis, it might give you the breathing space in which to investigate further. Frequently, the letter um, will leave a lot of unanswered questions. And in that case, there's nothing wrong with going back and asking to have those questions answered by, by the claimant if they genuinely uh, arise. Don't be facetious and don't try to be uh, too clever. But if you genuinely don't know uh, what position is being advanced against you, there is nothing wrong with asking. So if um, having marshaled all of the facts and, and understood the claimant's case as best you can, you conclude that there is reason for you to change or remove anything that you've written, you should write back to the claimant and explain yourself um, and you should consider giving the claimant a right of reply. You should consider removing the article altogether. Um, but you need to be communicating. If you uh, think, on the other hand, that there's nothing wrong with what you've written and nothing has changed in your thinking, uh, and then you have a cast iron defence, then you also need to say that. Don't bury your head in the sand. Um, just remember this, a quick correction and apology is capable of hugely reducing any damages. It might even expunge uh, the serious harm requirement altogether. Uh, one of the first cases on the serious harm uh, threshold after the 2013 Act uh, established exactly that. A correction was made within a week and it was found that the resulting publication uh, didn't give rise to serious harm to the claimant's reputation, so the claim failed. You must remember if you're running a public interest defence, you need to consider very carefully um, at each stage whether uh, it still serves the public interest to, 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 to publish the material as initially published. Um, so some uh, public interest defences, which look very attractive as at the date of publication, crumble when things are pointed out by uh, correspondence from the claimant's solicitor. And you need to be alive to that because publication doesn't begin and end on the date that you put something uh, online. It continues and so does your um, potential uh, public interest defence, that, that, that uh, comes to be assessed at every stage whilst the material is still being published. So I've, I've whistled through those points just uh, as a way of uh, helping to uh, bring our introductions to a close. And I'll hand back uh, now, I think, to Joe, because I think we're going to try and answer some questions uh, put by you. Thank you, Jonathan, for that um, incredibly helpful whistle-stop tour. Um, I will certainly be coming back to you um, and indeed to Tamsin, um, I imagine, um, more frequently than I would like. Um, we're really, really grateful for the support this event is having. We've been having consistently around a thousand, sometimes over 1,100 people um, watching this event. It's plain there is very considerable public interest in the public interest uh, defence. Um, so we have five written questions, which I'll run through and allocate to members of the panel. 
Um, and there will then, I hope, be time too to take questions from um, uh, audience members now. So the first question is, if I fight and lose a defamation case, how much money could I end up having to, to stump up? Um, Tamsin, would you like to have a, a crack at that? Yes, a lot is the answer. Um, if the question is how much money could you end up having to pay out, the answer is you could end up having to pay out your own lawyer's costs and the other side's lawyer's costs under the loser pays principle in civil proceedings. Um, those could easily be as much as uh, um, 800,000, 900,000, a million pounds each. Now that's um, a terrifying sum and that's the very worst, um, well not the very worst case scenario, it could get even worse. Uh, occasionally you can find lawyers who will work for you on a no win, no fee or no win, low fee basis, even for defendants. Um, it's more difficult for defendants than for claimants. Um, but if your opponent is wealthy, that helps in the sense that um, your, the lawyers are more likely, your lawyers are more likely to be paid at the end if there's a no win, if, if, if they're um, being paid just dependent on your winning. Um, and if you lose, you don't have to pay anything. So if you can get a no win, low fee or a no win, no fee agreement with your lawyers, then that will reduce the amount payable by half. Um, nearly. Uh, you can occasionally get insurance to um, help you with the risk of having to pay adverse costs. Um, after the event insurance uh, commands a very, very high premium, sometimes as much as half of the sum insured, but the premiums are still payable by the opponent. So again, if you've got a rich opponent who can pay the premium, although it's scary because they can afford lawyers, it's also helpful because they may be able to um, pay the premium at the end, which means the insurers are more likely to agree to insure you. Um, there's also crowdfunding as a, a way of funding libel claims. So although the sums are eye-watering, and libel always used to be described as a rich man's game, there are arrangements with lawyers and ways of um, raising money which work, um, and people do manage to defend difficult cases on that on that basis, but it is it, it's not straightforward. There is no um, legal aid for libel, although it, in in theory it's supposed to be occasionally available. Um, it's very difficult. We're applying at the moment. I'm representing a group of women who accused a man of abuse and was sued, and um, we're applying for legal aid in that case, and it's being it's proving extremely difficult. And ironically enough, one of the reasons why the legal aid board is, is is causing problems is because they say well you can raise money from the public um from crowdfunding now that was never meant to replace public proper public funding um for legal cases um, and so that's a bit of a worrying development um but yeah the the, the bottom line is it could be a lot um but it can be mitigated Thank you, Tamsin. Um, very, very helpful. Um, and the second question is, can you explain more about the honest opinion defence? Does my opinion have to be based on actual facts? Um, what if it's just what I've seen on the internet? And Jonathan, can I ask you to have a crack at that question? Sure. So the honest opinion um, defence is one of the most um, misunderstood um, I think by non-lawyers. Tamsin explained it extremely well earlier, or at least uh, the, the um, its potential usefulness. Uh, I should sound a note of caution. It is quite difficult uh, to succeed in an honest opinion defence, um, and they frequently fail because um, the court determines that in fact what you said amounted to an allegation of fact. And I, I, I'll just outline the requirements. It's, it's now a statutory defence. Um, and it's in section three of the 2013 Act, and it, it says this, it is a defense to an action for defamation for the defendant to show that the following conditions are met. The first condition is that the statement complained of was a statement of opinion, and we'll come on and I'll, I'll give a couple more examples about what, what the difference between opinion and fact. So first you've got to show that it's an opinion. The second condition is that the statement complained of 
indicated, whether in general or specific terms, the basis of the opinion. What that means is you've got to show in your writing um, the basis for what you've said. Um, it's not enough just to say it, because if you just say it, it indicates that you may have a basis for it. And that basis may or may not be uh, true. So the, um, the third uh, condition is that an honest opinion, uh, an honest person could have held the opinion on the basis of any fact which existed at the time the statement of complaint was published uh, or anything that's privileged. And that, that means that the facts, that, the, the basis that you indicate must pertain. It must be true. And um, the, as I said, most people get uh, uh, caught on the first condition. That is that they they say what what they publish is a matter of opinion, but in fact it's taken to be an allegation of fact. Um, and I'm going to give you an example, a very recent example from the case law, and that is this. Um, th th these are words spoken in an interview um, with Andrew Marr. Well, I was at a meeting in the House of Commons. And the two people I referred to had been incredibly disruptive. Indeed, the police wanted to throw them out of the meeting. I didn't. I said they should remain in the meeting. They'd been disruptive at a number of meetings. At the later meeting, when Manuel spoke, they were quiet. But they came up and were really, really strong on him afterwards. And he was quite upset by it. I know Manuel quite well. And I was speaking in his defence. Manuel, of course, is the Palestinian ambassador to this country. They were very, very abusive to Manuel, very abusive. And I was upset on his behalf from what he'd, he'd spoken, obviously, at the meeting, but also the way he was treated by them at the end of it. And so I felt I should say something in his support. And I did. Now, those are words uh, spoken by Jeremy Corbyn in an interview with Andrew Marr. And uh, the person he was accused, uh, he was accusing of being disruptive has sued him, uh, Mr. Millet. And um, the uh, Mr. Corbyn has sought to defend himself uh, on the basis that he was simply uh, giving his opinion and that what he said uh, when he accused um, Mr. Millet of being disruptive and abusive was a matter of opinion. And that has failed both at first instance in the High Court and now in the Court of Appeal. Um, so uh, the meaning established by the judge at first instance um, and upheld by the Court of Appeal is uh, the factual allegation that um, the claimant, Mr. Millet, attended a meeting at the House of Commons, behaved in so disruptive a way at this meeting that the police wished to remove him from the premises. Um, that's a, uh, the first section of it. So in other words, um, the uh, allegation of abusiveness and disruptiveness, which sound descriptive, they sound um, like they are uh, drawing uh, a, an inference from a set of facts were in fact held to be allegations of fact. Now, I think uh, in the interest of time, I won't go on and give the second example um, that I had in mind, um, but I would just uh, conclude by warning against seeking uh, to, too frequently to rely on honest opinion. If you've taken on board Tamsin's uh, really useful tips about uh, being clear about what you intend, then uh, it, you should uh, be able normally to rely um, on having asserted facts which you're capable of asserting, either outright guilt of a, a discreditable conduct or something approaching that in a, in a lesser degree of um, culpability, like grounds to investigate or grounds to suspect. If you apply that degree of clarity to your writing from the outset, then you shouldn't need to rely on uh, the defence of honest opinion. But if you do, just be careful um, that you've expressed an opinion and not a fact. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, third question. How can an activist raise awareness to the issues that motivate his or her activism in a way most likely to engage the interest and support of media outlets? Gracie. You might be on mute, Gracie. Donna, see that, yeah. Um... All I was saying was that's a really interesting question. I suppose that, you know, in the context of my work at Liberty and how we work at Liberty, distinct from Liberty Investigates, which is its own journalism unit, I mean, 
our comms director is always really keen to remind us of kind of the pull of the new, essentially. So often we will collaborate with MPs to get parliamentary questions down that maybe reveal something new. So when we were campaigning around the use of migrant children's data, education data for immigration enforcement, I believe it was Caroline Lucas that put down a parliamentary question to ask, well, how many children's data has been shared in this way and on how many occasions? And the response came back from government and that was a real bombshell. And we really used that to launch our campaign. Um, I would say that similarly, kind of bringing together coalitions of people and often unlikely coalitions of people. Um, so, you know, one voice might not get something into the media, but actually when you maybe have 30 rights groups with quite broad mandates and, um, you know, not necessarily who, people who wouldn't necessarily speak with the same voice coming together to make a statement about something like a new piece of legislation, for example, that will often pique the interest of the media. And I think similarly, although it's you have to be really careful in how you do this and you really have to build relationships with people and make it reciprocal, I think media are often really keen to hear from people who are directly affected by an issue. As activists, that can often be us, but sometimes it's not us. Sometimes we're working with other people who are closer to an issue. But I think, you know, earlier in my career, I did, I did a lot of work with people who'd survived torture and other kind of forms of organised violence. And, you know, we would get media calls that were sort of like, do you have a torture survivor who can speak to such and such at this time on broadcast? And that at that time, you know, this was a few years ago, there was really was not an understanding of how you should treat people, the sensitivity with which you should handle things, and actually that there should be some reciprocity there rather than just you kind of extracting something from people. Um, so those kind of individual stories, those personal testimonies, can be really powerful, but you really have to make sure that you are working with people and kind of, you know, making sure that people actually want to do something and it's their own kind of, their own free decision. They'll be supported before and after um, if you're going to do that. And I mean, also media just really like it when people are actually doing something. So we'll often get a lot of interest in, you know, when we're taking litigation, for example, or, you know, when we published our alternative coronavirus act, I think, Sometimes actually just doing stuff will help to pique media interest rather than simply, this is a bad thing that's happening. When it's a new bad thing that's happening, there will be interest. When it's been going on for five years, you have to get a bit creative. Thanks, Gracie. Um, uh, and um, rather than just being a, a, a garishly dressed compare, um, may I offer this, that we seek to um, meet that important balance that Gracie identifies um, by giving people who we want to speak to issues we care about control over um, the content. So we're working um, with uh, care-experienced um, children who have been mistreated by the care system and we're having a discussion with a, a leading journalist who is herself a um, care experienced and we've offered to provide her with a TV crew and give her final edit rights um, so that she can give confidence to the people to whom she's speaking um, that the content is content that they will be happy with I think it is very, very important to try and create a relationship of trust um, with people. And I think we owe them um, uh, more than our campaigning um, in support of their trauma. Um, maybe the last question we have time for, um, what sort of things are definitely in the public interest? I'm worried about thinking something is in the public interest um, when a judge might not agree. Um, Tanzan, can I pass that one, please, to you? Well, there's, um, I mean, it's fair to be worried about that because judges often have their own views, which don't seem to fit with what everyone thinks. But there isn't a statutory definition in this context of the public interest. So it's a, a movable feast. But I think if I was going to describe it, I'd say things. Uh, I'd, I'd say that it is uh, information which it is valuable for the public to know in a democracy. So how people who are in positions of trust or authority are behaving, 
um, making allegations of wrongdoing or misconduct against people who have an important role in society, either maybe even as role models, but certainly in a public role. Um, and um, allegations of wrongdoing against employers or against um, uh, uh, people who have authority over you can also be public interest subject matter. Um, certainly anything to do with political behavior, voting, elections, um, conduct of de democracy generally. Uh, so it, factual, the factual subject matter matters less than the role of the people who you're criticizing. Um, anything to do with tax, um, uh, uh, is, is usually a question of public interest because it affects a lot of people in an important way um, and affects our public services. Um, so I can't give you a, 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 a checklist or a clear um, definition, um, but those are the sorts of things where courts have already found that they're in the public interest and a, a judge would be bound to find them in a new case also in public interest. Thank you. Thank you, Tamsin. Um, time for one last question. Um, if I get a threatening letter, can I publish it to show the world what is happening to me? What are the downsides of doing this? Um, certainly in my experience, there is something particularly pernicious in receiving letters from people who are very, very wealthy um, who are using that wealth to engage enormously expensive lawyers and issue threats to you, but who choose to make those threats to you and assert confidentiality over the fact of them making those threats so that the world at large um, cannot see the use to which they are putting their wealth. Um, Jonathan, can I put that question to you? Thanks. Uh, yeah, the, um, it's a, it's a, a been a matter of some d debate, but um, we, we, normally the letter that I described earlier says emblazoned across the top, uh, private and confidential, not for publication. And as Joe jo says, I mean that. That can be pretty offensive in a case which is solely based on publication and where you think someone is seeking to massage their public image. Um, the fact that it says strictly private and confidential, not for publication, uh, uh, is of fairly uh, low grade relevance to the issue of whether legally you can publish it, actually. Um, what matters is whether it genuinely contains matters which might be considered private and confidential. Um, and um, if it does no more than sort of argue the toss with you about what you've published, then it, it may well not do so. But you need to be a bit careful in case it genuinely contains uh, private details or confidential details um, uh, belonging to the claimant. Um, and it would be wrong probably to publish those, or at least you'd leave yourself exposed for doing so. There may also be copyright issues if you were to simply slap the whole thing uh, online. Um, but uh, the other reason to be careful about doing it is that it, it's likely um, to seriously uh, aggravate any damages that you may be liable for in the event that you lose. Um, you may not really care at this end of proceedings very much about thinking uh, about whether you're going to go down for sort of 50,000 or 75,000 pounds in damages, but it could make that difference um, if you're seen to have been behaving um, in a way uh, which adds to the claimant's uh, distress in in response to receiving the letter. So there's no um, there's no simple answer. Um, I've seen people do increasingly um, publish letters, and if, um, what one solution might be um, to make it publicly known um, through your uh, uh, website or or a, a, another um, mode of publication that it, it, uh, letters received about what you're publishing will routinely be published. At least then um, a, a letter from a solicitor would be written in that expectation, but even that might not be bulletproof. So you need to approach, approach it with some caution. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, 
we don't, I'm afraid, have time for any more. I hope you found it um, a useful use of an hour. Um, we will publish on our Google Project website a guide um, to defamation proceedings. Um, in a, a better world, um, Google Project would very much like to set up a, a fund so that um, campaigners um, and small publishers seeking to perform valuable functions in an increasingly imperiled democracy can consolidate their risk by self-insuring. So if there are um, amongst the thousand or so people still watching um, who would like to contribute to such a fund, um, we would be very pleased to, to hear from you. Um, thank you hugely to Tamsin, Gracie and Jonathan and to all of you for, for watching. We're incredibly grateful for your support. Thank you.